This episode of the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show is brought to you by Squarespace, the beautiful and intuitive website publishing platform that allows anyone, you, me, your friends, your family, people that play baseball, people that commentate baseball, people that have nothing to do with baseball, crazy people on the street. Maybe they want to start a conspiracy theory website. Farmers, scientists, kids that play hopscotch, literally anybody can create professional web pages, blogs, online stores, and galleries on a single platform. And they make it so easy. All you have to do is go through uh, their gallery of award winning templates, pick one that suits you. You can tweak it a little bit, maybe add your own spice or not. It looks great already. And then, you know, fill it with whatever you want blog posts, images, conspiracy theories, things you want to sell. They have a new e commerce platform that makes it easy to sell things. All Squarespace accounts come with 24 7 support as well as cloud hosting. You get real time analytics so you can know how many people are reading your crazy conspiracy theories. And if you sign up for a year, you even get a free domain name. Here's what I want you to do for a free trial of all these great services, plus 10% off your first purchase for new customers. Go to squarespace.com slash Jeff Rubin and enter the promo code dork. Go to squarespace.com slash Jeff Rubin and enter the promo code dork. Go to squarespace. I'm just kidding. That's it. I think you got it at this point. Squarespace.com promo code dork. You guys got to check this thing out. I think the best part about the internet, and there's a lot of good parts about the internet, is not only the never-ending stream of new things to consume, but also that you have the opportunity to create things for others to consume. And it's never going to be easier to make it look good than it will be right now if you go to Squarespace. Okay, let's talk about Nintendo. Hey everybody, welcome to the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. I am Jeff Rubin, and right away here at the top of the show, I'd like to hop in the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin time machine. Let me take you back. The year is 1980-something. I'm not exactly sure what year it is yet. Uh, But a little something called the Nintendo Entertainment System has just come out and completely revitalized the video game market. The console is so popular that Nintendo has established a hotline that people can call when they might need assistance beating a game. And if you call that hotline, the person helping you, walking through your problems, might very well be today's guest, Eric Blattner. Eric, welcome to the show. Thanks, Jeff. Glad to be here. Now, did I describe the situation correctly? Did I describe the Nintendo hotline? Uh, Yeah, I'd say he pretty much nailed it. At the point I joined Nintendo and, and got on the phones... The uh, the NES was, as you said, bringing back the video game industry from the dead, and they had released the Game Boy, the first handheld system. So what year is that? Uh, this would have been 1989, the mm-hmm. year I graduated from high school. So this is like a high school job for you? Pretty much. I had a, a job as a fry cook in a drive-in restaurant while I was in high school, but this would have been my first job after leaving the nest, so to speak. And was the hotline up and running for a while at that point? It had been up for a while. Um, It was already a department of a couple hundred people. Uh, The guys who trained me originally had been around for the Nintendo Power Fest and done that tour. Um, So it it had been there for a little while. What was the Nintendo Power Fest? Uh, Jeez, I hope I'm calling it by the right name. But it was essentially a a multi-city tour where they, they went out and people could go down to like a convention space and play games and they would throw out prizes they would have questions and answer sessions with howard um who was a uh, sort of a figure they had turned into a uh, caricature cartoon in the nintendo power magazine sure i remember howard and nestor yeah, Howard was a real guy, though. All right, so we have, we got a lot to break down here. Let's talk about, like, actually getting this job. Are you in Washington where Nintendo is, was? Yeah, they uh, they came to Redmond, Washington, I don't know in what year, but that would have been back when they were still primarily a, an arcade company, um, when they had the, uh, the Donkey Kong machines and Radar Scope. They built a warehouse in Redmond, Washington, which is the town where I lived, um, they were actually, you know, less than a mile from the house I grew up in, and uh, it was all part of a big redevelopment of Redmond when my family moved there in the early 70s. You know, the area we lived in was still mostly forested, 
but we saw companies like Nintendo come in and build huge warehouses, and that's where the Microsoft complex was built. Um, those were all fields and woods I used to play in as a kid. Um, but that, that happened sometime during my elementary, junior high years. Um, I didn't have an NES at that time, so I was sort of caught up to the uh, phenomenon again when I knew I was going to go work there. Uh, basically, my brother and my best friend uh, had found a job there through a temp agency. This amazing thing. They were getting paid to play video games and just talk about them on the phone. And they told me about it. So I went down to the local temp agency and said, hey, I want that job. That sounds cool. Were you good at Nintendo? Were you, were, were you a Nintendo kid? I mean, everyone plays video games now. But back then, if you played video games, that, that was uh, a little more defining, I think. Yeah, I had had an... an yeah, an Atari growing up, and, you know, I had played around on various computers and played games like the uh, Commodore 64 and 128, so I was definitely a gamer, although I didn't, as I said, I didn't have an NES at that time, so I was sort of catching up to that. Um, when I knew I was going to try and get a job there, I started playing my, my roommate's NES pretty heavily. To build up my, my game knowledge, I knew that was one of the things they checked for was how well you knew certain games. So that's like part of the job interview is is quizzing you about games? Quizzing you to find out that you're a game player and that you can answer questions. During my interview, they, they actually did sit me down in a cubicle and uh, had me play a game for 15 or 20 minutes and then came back to ask me questions about it. What game was that? Do you remember? Uh, it was like a river race game of some kind. Do you remember any of the questions they asked you? I'm so curious about, like, what Nintendo is looking for when they're hiring someone to help other people play video games. Well, they, they were looking for the ability to talk on the phones primarily. So they just want to hear you talk about video games to hear that you can do that somewhat eloquently. Because not everyone that likes video games uh, is capable of talking about them in a way that is not uh, com a complete turnoff for other people. Right. Right. Well, they... At the time they hired me, there was, a, uh, there was still a split between the gameplay counselors and the customer service representatives who handled the more traditional CSR type of calls, like, my Nintendo's broken, or I have a problem with my Nintendo Power subscription. Whereas gameplay counselors, which is, or what you did, what, what was their exact role? Well, they, they answered specifically questions about games. They had, at the time, it was just a toll number. It was a 206 area code number that you could call long distance charges would apply but no no like 900 number no like 25 cents a minute or anything like that no that that eventually happened while i was there they they changed it to a 900 line and they they had merged the csr and gpc role so that their uh, their phone reps were handling all types of calls but and gpc is gameplay counselor is that right yeah and csr yeah. is just like your traditional customer service representation i'm, I'm guessing here that's correct okay great so, um, so they, they merged those eventually. But for a time, it's just a free phone call. Nintendo's just running the service to like help people enjoy their product? Yeah. And uh, the, the gameplay counselors kind of had this sort of uh, rock star attitude of, holy smokes, we're, we're the pros. We're sitting here playing games, and you call us up, and we help you. I mean, I was into Nintendo hardcore in this era, as was every single person I was friends with. Because if, if you weren't, I, I, like, I didn't know what to talk to you about. And I've never heard of anyone calling this number. Was it a popular thing? Like, when you're working the lines, were you on the phone all the time? There's just always calls coming in? Pretty much. At various times, I worked different shifts. And if you worked the 4 a.m. shift, which covered the East Coast folks, it would be kind of slow early in the morning. But it, it would pick up, and you would be answering back-to-back -back calls through most of your shift. So it was also open 24 hours around the clock? No, 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 no. It, it opened at 4 a.m. and closed down at, I don't know, I think midnight or so. I see, I see. So most of the day, though, they shut down for four hours just to, like, air it out a little, but for almost the entire day, you can call up and get gameplay tips. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Do you have to, like, train and become good at video games? That's the first thing they did with you when they hired you, was put you through a training process. Oh, my God, I want to know everything about that training process. <laughs> How do they train you? Like, what is Nintendo's... Because Nintendo, they're the ones making the game, so what do they do? What is Nintendo's idea for what you need to do to get good at their products? Well, it's, it's know the answers to the most commonly asked questions for the most commonly called about games, which at the time were things like The Legend of Zelda, The Adventures of Link, uh, Metroid. Your more typical call would 
be, you know, other codes for this game, and you could go consult the database for that. But there was a, you know, large list of games, or a short list of games, rather, that they got the bulk of their calls on. So when they hired me, they put us into a uh, training room off in some wing of the building, and we played those games. Uh, the first thing I did was ask to play a, a Link to the Past because it's one I had, I had mastered knowing that I was coming to work there. And I even remember finishing it on the first day um, and coming back to my lead and saying, here, I'm done with this. Can I have the next one? And I said, did you use the cheat? And, and I said, what? There's a cheat? Some of those NES games are so much more difficult um, just harder, more difficult to penetrate than the games of today. Games of today, like, I'm not saying this is necessarily bad. I think it's probably good. Um, will hold your hand and, like, they want you to beat the game. They want you to see the whole thing. Those Nintendo games are punishing. This is where I sound like an old man and I say kids today don't know how good they have it because you're absolutely right. I mean, back, back in those days, you know, you would get a game, and that would be the only game you'd have to play for months until you could trade it to your friends. So they were designed to be, you know, tough and challenging. And there was no internet. You couldn't go, you know, look up YouTube videos on how to do something. And, you know, there weren't, you know, too many codes or anything. So you had to sit there and beat the game. Some of them didn't even have saves. Yeah, the no save thing is, is particularly difficult, you know. Um, now, you, I mean, I, I'm not saying it's better or worse. It's better or worse for some games. I think there are some games today uh, that are still extremely difficult that are out there. Like, that challenge is there if you're willing to look for it. But mainstream games certainly uh, are a little more inviting. And, I mean, gaming's become a more mainstream hobby, so I think they probably had to do that. Well, yeah, you have so many entertainment choices. When you get frustrated with a the game these days... You just put it down and move on to the next game you picked up on the Steam sale. Um, you know, back then, you didn't have a lot of options. Getting a game was a much more special thing. I mean, I don't know if it's because we were kids or there were less games. Uh, probably both, but yeah, it's a little bit. definitely less games. So let's get back to this training process. You're there. You beat Adventures of Link in a day. And that's just like you're getting paid all day to sit there and beat as part of your job training to beat Adventures of Link. Oh, yeah. And then what happens? Well... You go through uh, the most popular games like Super Mario Brothers 3, um, Super Mario Brothers 1. You'd play Super Mario Brothers 2, but we didn't get as many calls on that. Ooh, interesting. Uh, and, you know, you'd, you'd go through this list of games, Metroid and what have you, and then there would be a test. Um, they, they essentially tested your knowledge to see whether you were going to be able to answer questions quickly on the phone or whether you're going to spend all your time looking up the answer in a database. And what kind of questions are these? Are they like, how do I find the freeze ray in Metroid? But it would be something like that. How do I find a specific item in Metroid? But it would also be, you know, how do I get through the uh, ninth level of Legend of Zelda in the second quest? Um, or, you know, where do I find this particular item? Uh, what dun dungeon is next? That kind of thing. And did Nintendo train you to play Adventures of Link or Metroid or whatever game it happens to be? Or did they want you to figure it out yourself? Well, they'd give you all the training materials they had at hand, all the hand-drawn maps and whatnot that you needed to get through it. it. It wasn't that they wanted you to play it. They wanted you to be able to answer questions on it. But generally, to, to answer questions on right, it, right. you had to play it. So... If a new game comes out, is that your responsibility then to play it, learn it, and uh, be prepared to answer questions about it? Yeah. they. Uh, so when they hired you, not only did you go through this training process, but they would they gave you an NES. They gave you a Game Boy. Um, you know, later on, I would get a Super NES and a Virtual Boy. And provided you worked there for a year from the date they gave it to you, that became your system. And then at your desk, you also had an NES with an NES Advantage and a TV. And the and Advantage was the joystick, right? Yeah, it was a heavy metal base. Yeah, those things were big for something that only needed two buttons. Yeah, but they were the best thing for tough games. Well, what, what advantage do you get from the NES Advantage? It's just an easier control to use than those little uh, square, you know, handheld controllers that came with the nes yeah those are tough to hold the joystick was a much more precision instrument than the little plus pad was so your first gameplay counselor tip get an nes advantage yeah it's funny people would actually accuse me of being a company shill but the truth of the matter is if you were stuck on a really tough action game that was the best advice i could give you and then it also had the slow-mo feature which was the uh 
rapid pause on pause. Mm-hmm. It was practically like a hardware cheat. It's basically the game is just pressing start as fast as you can. Some games that works great, and some it does not. Like, if pause brings you to a different inventory screen, it just does not work in that game. Yeah. But I remember using something like that on Super Nintendo to beat one of the Earthworm Gym levels where you have to, like, helicopter down a pit of spikes and kind of, like, avoid the spikes on either side, and I used that in that game. And I'm, I'm finally ready to admit that to the world. Yeah, and if you were playing something like Battletoads, you were crazy oh, to yeah, not have course. something like that. I mean, Battletoads is notoriously... Th- you know, I don't know that it's the most difficult game, but I think it is the most notorious game because it's a great game. It's a great-looking game. It might be the best-looking game on the NES. Certainly, like, it's got style, you know? It's got, it's got like, uh, panache. Uh, and the first two levels are super fun and inviting. And then that third level, the uh, infamous Speed Bikes level, is extraordinarily difficult to get past. I think it's like when people try to think of a hard thing on Nintendo, that's the first thing they're going to think of. Can you beat that level? Can you beat that game? I never beat the game. Actually, a, a friend and I who worked there kind of made it a personal challenge to try and do it in co-op. And, you know, we would go to my apartment and hang out and watch The Simpsons and, you know, make it a night of playing it. And, you, again, it's hard for kids to understand today. We, you just had to play it over and over and over again. And it was tough. We eventually got up to... It's like a seventh or eighth level where you have to grab onto the handlebar of this little uh, wheelie thing that takes you along the walls and floor. And in two-player mode, we discovered a fatal bug where one player just died immediately. Uh, so that kind of took the uh, took the fun out of it for us, and we abandoned that endeavor. But I spent many weeks playing that game. Is that one you get a lot of calls about? Yeah, we got a lot of calls about it. Um, Oftentimes, the question would be, do you have any codes? You know, we, that was one of our more common calls. We'd get a call from a kid who had a stack of 10 games, and he would just go down the list. Are there any codes for extra men for this? Any codes for this game? Any codes for that? I mean, I get what you do if someone's like, I don't, I'm stuck in the 8th dungeon in Zelda. Where's Ganon? And you're like, oh, you gotta, there's this wall you got to blow a hole in with a bomb. But if someone's like, I can't beat the speed bike level of Battletoads, what do you tell them? Because it's just like, practice Battletoads all day until you can beat the level. Is there, is there any other advice you can give? Well, that's kind of where the counselor and gameplay counselor came from. Because sometimes it was just that. It's just offering encouragement, stick to it, you know, personal oh stories and God. anecdotes. No, and you had to tell anecdotes? Like you inspiring know, I- gameplay stories on your, of your own? Exactly. Like, I had so much trouble with that. I spent the last two weeks doing it. Oh my Eventually, god. I got it. It felt so good to finally beat it. I know you can do it. Oh, my God. This is amazing. Did, so did you have, like, a go-to inspiring story that you used all the time? No, but I did, you know, have some sort of stock lines, like, you know, shooter games. If it moves, shoot it. If it doesn't move, shoot it anyways. Because who's calling? Are you dealing mostly with kids here? Uh, you know, that was kind of the perception, but... Honestly, you would get calls from people of all ages. I would get calls from people in senior citizen centers where, you know, that's what they did. Is they'd, you know, to keep their minds active, they'd play video games. Or you'd get calls from, you know, the kids or, you know, lots of calls from the parents who were playing the games. Uh, Final Fantasy had just come out before I joined the, the company and we were still getting a lot of calls on that, and that was back when Final Fantasy was actually not on rails, and you could go get lost, and people had mm-hmm, real questions yeah. about where to go and what to do. Now, tell me more about this database you had. You mentioned this before. Is this on computers, or is this like a big stack of papers with every Nintendo map hand-drawn? It's actually a combination. Um, the database was a program called ELMO. I, I don't remember what ELMO stands for. But essentially, it was a very primitive form of hyperlinked document. I actually worked on the, the Elmo team for a time, where we would get games, particularly, in a, you know, hopefully in advance, um, but we would play through them and write up what we called quick plays. And as we're playing them, you know, we played them with a the gameplay counselor's eye towards what kind of questions are these games going to generate, and we would write the, uh, the quick play with that in mind. And then, in addition to that, we had you know large binders full of hand-drawn, photocopied maps that had just sort of accumulated as a tribal knowledge. And you know we'd get a new handout every once in a while and just add it to our binder. And then we all had 
copies of Nintendo Power magazine at our desk. We'd get those and whatever strategy guides came out. So we had all of those resources available to us, and we had a game library uh, so that you could play games while you were on the phone or play games at home, and the idea was you were building up your, your knowledge base. How long did you work there? I worked there from about 80, from 89 to 94. So that's a while, because it sounds like you, you kind of went up the ranks to the point where you're like researching things and you, haven't, you, you know the business so well that you, know, you can play a game and anticipate what kind of questions people are going to ask. What, how did you know what to look for or what did you look for? It kind of, I mean, that, that's where the, the playing a lot of games really came into it. Um, you would play a lot of games. You would kind of get an idea for where you get stuck or where your what your questions are, and you know generally if you get stuck, that's where the the public's going to get stuck. Um, you know, in the many years since then, I've I've been involved in the video game industry, spent a lot of time as a tester, and it's the same thing with that. When you play a game, you play it with a tester's eye. You look at it and you can figure out where to break things. Um, mm-hmm. But it was the same thing with, with answering the questions. You knew where people were going to have trouble. Do you remember any games playing them and being like, uh-oh, we're getting a lot of calls about this one? Yeah, uh, that probably would have been uh, Super Mario World. I'm surprised to hear that because that game's pretty... I think that game's pretty accessible. I think it's probably easier than most Nintendo games. It, it is, but you know, you can take that game and there are probably you know, 10 spots within it where there's a particular part of the level where people have trouble with mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I, I i'm, I'm going to have trouble giving you specifics like there is a ton of information that has been in my mind i used to be able to walk you through the roan cave of dragon warrior 2 from memory i couldn't do it to save my life now my brain has long since filed that information away is no longer useful that's like that's a, a good thing that your brain did though isn't that like interesting that your brain was like i don't think we need this anymore and it's it was probably correct yeah, you can accumulate a lot of useless knowledge. Man, so a lot of different genres, because we're talking about Mario, we're talking about RPGs like Final Fantasy and Dragon Warrior. Did you have a, a particular type of game that, not even that's your favorite game, but uh, one that you like to talk about or that was like fun to get calls about? I was a big fan of the Koei games. Um, they made Romance of the Three Kingdoms, is that right? Right. Genghis Khan was the first one I played, but they were strategy games that they were sort of a niche game on the NES. They, they definitely had their following and amongst the gameplay counselors it was, you know, I was one of the few people that could sit there and really talk intelligently about them. That makes sense that that's, that's like a gameplay counselor's game because it's a little, it's deep it's strategic, there were probably not a lot of games like that on the NES. Yeah, and you know, there were even on the NES, there were more games than any one person could really play and master. So we had specialists that we, you know, we knew who in the department could answer questions on certain games. So if you called me and, and I couldn't answer your question off the top of my head and I knew there was somebody there who could, I would just transfer you. Uh, we, we did that quite a bit. Um, and I would get a lot of those type of transfer calls for things like the, the Koei games. What were your specialties? What did what else did you get transfer calls about? Zelda? Uh, Strider, actually. Oh. Strider, it was one of those games that I had access to before I started there, and I had just mastered it. And uh, I, could descri- I could describe in great detail how to do something. There was one level you had to jump off a ledge and fall several screens with. And I remember dealing with somebody who who didn't understand that you had to jump there, and they didn't believe me when I told them. So I described the entire level from the beginning, each turret that popped up, each enemy that dropped onto the screen, and then I said, and when you get to that dead end, you jump off the ledge. Oh, my God. I love how, like, positive you are. It didn't even occur to me that, like, you know, it, it, you're part of their gameplay experience, and it's up to you to make it fun for them. Is that, like, something else Nintendo trained you in, just staying positive and, like, what kind of attitude to have? Yep, and you know there was certain terminology they wanted us to avoid. You never killed enemies; you defeated them. Um, and you know there was certainly it, it wasn't something that they drilled too hard on, but they you know wanted you to present like well opportunities like selling the NES Advantage. Um, you know it was good news if you could convince somebody to go buy something, or if somebody loved a game and you knew 
games that were similar that they would also enjoy, they would want you to, to sort of soft sell those. Mm-hmm. And that's not even something you're directly, it sounds like not even something you're directly selling on the phone. Nintendo just wants you, you know, talking about Nintendo products. Yeah, it wasn't really pushed heavily. It was at one point um, when Star Fox came out. They had this this desire for us to mention it on every single phone call. And I felt bad because I'd talk to people who were calling for the fourth or fifth time that day. And every time they called, one of us tried to sell them Star Fox, but they were pushing that one heavily at that time. Wait a minute. People are calling four or five times a day? It's just like an hour later, they're like, hey... Yeah, I, we spoke an hour ago. I was on level two. I'm on level four now. I'm stuck again. Yeah, some of those role-playing games uh, could be like that. That's so funny. Like, you get to the end of your rope, and you're like, I guess we got to call the hotline. And, you know, you like you get the tip. You need to get past it. You go back to the game. An hour later, you're like, oh, man, I'm uh-huh. stuck again. Like, you, you, need to have, you need to stick to it a little. I think those people just weren't... Uh, you know, maybe they were. Maybe they just needed a different game. It sounds like some people had trouble getting help too. I remember taking calls where somebody had driven out to a payphone forty miles from their house, and they were stuck playing Solstice, and they were just going crazy, and they had trouble figuring out this one room. And that was one where I would just say, "Wait, wait, 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 wait!" Before you ask me the question, do you have the code for Unlimited Lives? And they would say, "What? There's a code for Unlimited Lives? Give it to me!" What was it like when Game Genie came out? Were you guys like, uh oh, this thing might put us out of business? Well, that was, there were certain things that we tried to actively discourage, like the purchase of Tengen games. Mm hmm. Why and was that? I know, like, I know there's something weird about Tengen games. The cartridges are shaped differently. I know they made a bootleg version of Tetris. Like, they seem like a black sheep of the 8 bit family. Do you know the story there? Yeah. So, the, one of the core pillars of the business model for Nintendo was they manufactured all the carts. So they had a side business in making the actual physical hardware for the game. And anybody that published games on the Nintendo had to go through their their sort of licensing system. And they, they wanted games to have the Nintendo seal of quality on it, which meant they'd they had checked it. I mean, it's a very early precursor to what the game companies today still do with uh, technical certification requirements and licensing. But so uh, Tengen had had a falling out with Nintendo and basically decided to publish carts outside of that manufacturing pipeline and certification pipeline. Mm. So they, they were persona non grata for Nintendo and Game Genie was much the same way. They, uh, they were something that Nintendo did not see as adding value to the Nintendo because quite often it basically broke games by fiddling around with variables. You had to find that sort of magic code that tweaked all the variables just right to get it to do what you wanted to, but you could often have a very poor experience in the meantime trying to get there. So it was just Nintendo a trying to you know have some control over their their business model and b trying to make sure that they had the best play experience the best user experience possible so you don't believe in game genie um <clears throat> i don't know that i'd say i don't believe in it i mean we know it exists like we we can believe in it it's they're definitely real i've touched one <laughs> yeah no i uh, by the time that came out i was also answering customer service calls and it certainly was responsible for damaging and wrecking quite a few systems. Oh, because it like it physically, you know, you had to jam it in the system along with the game, which obviously the system wasn't meant to do. Yeah, that seventy-two pin connector in the original NES, they had thought of it as uh, as an innovation in the way it grabbed onto the cart and red carts. But as everybody, every kid from that era knows, that connector often was not very good, and you'd end up blowing in the system to try and get some moisture on the contacts to make the uh, make the thing work. Wait, is that what blowing... First of all, I'm so glad I'm talking to someone who at least was an official Nintendo representative about the subject. Blowing on the system, I've heard... I mean, obviously I did it back in the day, but I've heard since, now that we have an internet to, you know, fact-check things, blowing on the system, blowing in the games, does not work. Not And it's actually detrimental. Well, it, it works in the short term, but causes problems in the long term. Oh, wow. It, so the answer's even more nuanced than I had imagined. Yeah, it, <clears throat> that, 
if those connectors were not all seated properly, you know, you would get uh, garbage on the screen. So by blowing on those uh, connectors, you're adding a little bit of moisture from your breath, and that is oftentimes helping uh, make that connection. But in the long run, it would corrode those contacts. So and you really were better off cleaning your, your system with a uh, official Nintendo cleaning kit. Available for just nine ninety nine. Exactly. Right, right, right. Before you mention that, you often got a lot of calls about the same games. You know, and I don't think anyone's surprised to hear that you got a lot of calls about Zelda and Metroid. It, were most of the calls about a very few amount of games? Yes. Well, I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons the gameplay counselor role sort of diminished and disappeared over time. Because I'm sure somebody doing the bean counting on the back realized... We could, you know, answer most of these calls with automated lines, or we can cross-train our customer service representatives to just read from scripts. So increasingly, that you know sort of changed how they answered calls, and they were driven by that ninety percent of games that, or ninety percent of their calls were, you know, ten games. And what happens when someone calls up about just the worst, most obscure game? They've got a question about Jekyll and Hyde, just something terrible. Are you just walking around the office asking whoever's around, does anyone know where to find Jekyll's key? Right, well, hopefully it was in the Elmo Quick Play, or hopefully you had something on a paper map that answered that question. Um, you know, failing that, yeah, it was a matter of knowing who in the department was a specialist. Was there ever a time when just no one knew the answer and you were like, sorry, kid, you're on your own on this one? Occasionally that happened, and we would actually research it and call them back. Oh, wow. That's so full service. We had a business form called an ARF, an action request form, and it was actual hard copy. This was back before the office was automated and everything was on a network and we would fill it out and hand it in and somebody would divvy it out to a specialist to go figure it out oh my god it's like when no one else can handle the situation you gotta call in the specialist he's like the game counselor to the game counselors i would occasionally get those type of things for you know the, the games i've mentioned before like koei games i love that nintendo and i'm not surprised by this because nintendo I think is known um, as a reliable company. You know, everyone knows that whatever Nintendo puts out, if you see the Nintendo name on it, you're talking about a quality product. So I don't know why I'm so surprised to hear, like, what a thorough, well-thought-out product this customer service line was. I love that it's, like, satisfaction guaranteed, and if we can't answer your question, we're going to research it and get back to you. That's insane. Well, the funny thing is, it wasn't really that well-thought-out. It just kind of happened to them. Um, I know they... I don't remember the exact details of it you know some of the guys who trained me told me about the good old days when it all started up but they essentially uh, started giving people a number to call and they thought well we'll just get a few calls and we'll figure it out and the numbers that were coming into that toll line just kept growing and growing and growing and they ended up hiring you know hundreds of people to work to answer these calls hundreds hundreds wow. it was you know, the building that we were all in was essentially this large warehouse-type building, and a good chunk of one floor was all just a warren of cubicles. We were all sitting at them with headphones, answering questions. And, you know, it's amazing how many calls you can answer over the course of, you know, a couple of years. By the time I left, they had a placard up on the wall uh, called the 100K Club. And I was on that wall. I had taken over 100,000 phone calls. Oh, my God. They would average usually just a couple minutes, two or three minutes. And, you know, you figure eight hours a day of two to three minute phone calls. And then factor in things like Hell Week, which was the week after Christmas. <laughs> yeah, the, I bet it was. What was that? What was Hell Week like? Well, the rest of the company had it off as paid vacation. And we were in there working. Uh, they treated us really well, though. They gave us two and a half times pay. Wow, that's very generous, yeah. Well, they kind of had to do something when the rest of the company was getting paid to stay at home. Sure, sure. Um, and we would we would work as much overtime as we wanted during Hell Week. You know, that would be a great time to, to get a car payment saved up. Because you'd, uh, 
you'd spend as much time as you physically could at work during that week, just racking up the OT. Of those 100,000 calls you took, I'm assuming some were more memorable than others. Are there any over 20 years later that still stand out to you? Is it 20 years later to do the math right? It is over 20 years later. Are there any that you still remember? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I got called once by a radio station, like a morning drive time, shock jock type station. They had just called the line. They didn't go through PR or public relations or anything, and they just got me on the line. And mind you, one of the things they drill into you during training is you don't talk to the media. If you talk to the media when you're not authorized to do it, they will fire you. So I get on this call. It picks up. The announcer starts. I figure out what's going on, and I, I wanted to shit my pants. I didn't know what to do because I couldn't talk to them. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I'm on the air. If I hang up on them, that's not going to be good. I kind of had to actively discourage them to get me off the, the phone call and said, you know, did you call our PR guys? Well, you know, all right, I'll try and answer your questions. And they were asking me kooky stuff like, well, if I'm driving down the freeway in my semi and I've got an NES set up on the console, you know, what, what am I going to do when I get to this? And I said, well... I wouldn't suggest driving or playing video games. So you're just playing it straight. Well, I was trying to be a little bit humorous, and I, I kind of tried to upsell them on the Game Boy uh, for that mobile gaming need. Had to bring up Star Fox. It's, it's, yeah, it's the same type of thing. Jeez, what else did I get? Oh, my girlfriend called me once. She, uh, she was also a gameplay counselor, and she was at home on her day off. Were there a lot of female gameplay counselors? They were in the minority, but there were plenty of them. So she called me and heard my voice and immediately just said, oh, I bet you look cute when you're naked and hung up. And, you know, that just kind of stunned me. I didn't know where the call came from, so I was kind of weirded out by it for the rest of the day uh, until I got home and she told me what had happened. It sounds like it was pretty fun. Was it a cool job to have? Oh, yeah. They gave you free video game systems. You had a library of every game made. You could check them out. You know, we got we got paid pretty well for a kid straight out of high school. I was making good money and the annual bonuses and the hell week. It was it was a great job to have. What was the best part of the job? Playing video games for a living. Was that ever not fun? Like was there some day where they were like, you know, uh Adventure Island four just came out and you're like, oh god damn it, not another one of these and you just any any games you like dreaded having to get through? Uh, there were a few games that I believe I've blocked from my mind. I could probably go look at a list of NES games and tell you what they were, but not off the top of my head. But really, the the downside to that job was the burnout. Well, you were there for five years. It sounds like it was a slow burnout. You spend a couple of years there, and you answer a hundred thousand phone calls, and particularly once at, at one point. The gameplay counselors were essentially um, encouraged and incentivized to become customer service reps as well. Um, that was the only way I could get a shift that didn't start at 4 a.m. at one point, was to learn how to take Nintendo Power calls. So some of the sort of rock star quality of the job disappeared over time, and you started dealing with more traditional issues like sending people to service centers to fix their Nintendos or dealing with magazine subscription problems, that that was nowhere near as much fun. Is that what eventually caused you to leave the position? It, well, it was the burnout. It was just the, the tired of talking to people, you know, uh, particularly when you're not looking at somebody face-to-face and you're dealing with somebody over the phone. People can treat each other pretty crappy sometimes. And you'd get that angry mom who's mad because the babysitter is broken and she needs to take it to a repair center and it's going to cost her money to get fixed at, and she's yelling at you because of it. You know, stuff like that is tough to deal with after a while. But it's but it sounds like this job put you on the path of uh, at least working at least a little bit more in the video game industry. I've also never really talked to someone who was a game tester. What was that like? Well, it's... So there's there's this idea that game testers play games all day. And while that is true, it is not like being a gameplay counselor. Um, if you want to play Barbie Adventure and spend four months playing level five, <laughs> um, then testing is where you want to be. Um, it, it is a fun job in its own right, and it has its rewards, but it, it, when people 
ask me how great it is to, to be a tester, I say to them, well, what's your favorite meal? And they'll tell me, and I say, all right, how would you feel about eating that favorite meal every meal three times a day for four months in a row? How enthusiastic would you be about lasagna at that point? And that kind of gets the point across. Um, but still, despite, you know, things like that, it's, it's a great industry to be in. I love playing games for a living. Um, Nintendo kind of turned me on to that, and I've been doing it ever since. Do you remember, I'm sure you remember, what are some specific games that you tested? Well, <clears throat> I spent some time working for humongous entertainment they were sort of my first job and or my first test gig i had done it as a project basis in uh, at nintendo while i was still there like i played uh mario rpg i wow. played killer instinct for the game boy um, donkey kong country you know there were a number of titles i had done some project work on but those are those are great games i don't know about killer instinct for the game boy that sounds like it might have been difficult yeah. but uh donkey kong country mario rpg those those are terrific games particularly donkey kong country if i if i'm gonna be uh you know if i'm gonna have to play a game all the time and i still don't want to do it i'm still not saying this sounds fun but uh donkey kong country is a pretty solid pick for that era you know it's very replayable you can keep working at it get better at it sure Sure. Remember, one of the things you do as a tester is you balance test. You give feedback on whether a level is too hard. So you can thank us for some of those levels not being insanely difficult and only being very difficult. Yeah, it's a difficult game, but it's a fair game, and it's very fun. And the difficulty is, I, I would say, well-tuned. So great job on that one. I know for games, you know, uh, just like anything, like testing it is an important piece of it. You know, you got to see how it actually runs. So the game tester seemed like, like in a critical role. Like, what do you have to, what are the qualities you need to be a great game tester? To be an effective game tester? I remember uh, being in an interview at a company once, and somebody asked me something similar to that. You know, what, why are you a tester? And I said to them, well, I was the kind of kid that took apart my toys. I didn't put them back together, but I figured out how to take them apart and break them and she looked at me and then just looked at her co-worker to her side and said why do they all say that can you think of like a particular insight or the kind of insight you would usually have like using donkey kong country as an example like what is some feedback you might give for donkey kong country like this level is too hard this jump is too hard do you are even better would be if you remember anything specific well, i don't remember anything specific on that game um, do you remember anything specific on any game I try not to at this point. <laughs> yeah, I imagine like after you play the game a lot. But I'm just wondering like what, you know, what what that's like, what kind of feedback you give. Well, that that kind of feedback like uh difficulty challenge is a specific type of feedback a tester will give. Most of the time when you're playing a game, it's just straight up broken. Uh, I remember testing um Perfect Dark. I'd actually gone back to Nintendo as a contractor uh many years after I left it. I knew people in the testing department. And, uh, you know, that was a game where up until about a month before it shipped, we were wondering how it would ever ship. Um, it was just so broken. And then they start delivering these miraculous builds where it just cleans up. But for months, you know, we're using uh, codes or basically software test tools to, to jump in the particular levels. We don't see how it gets strung all together. You don't see things like loading screens. Levels are unsolvable. There are draw issues where you can see guys, you know, halfway across the map. Um, so a lot of your time is spent working with very broken games. How do you deliver that feedback? Like, are you just taking notes as you write it down, then you give them a piece of paper, and you're like, you know, using the sniper rifle makes the game shut off? Well, they're bug reports. Um, you know, a bug report, and this is it's funny because I actually do this now in my current line of work is teach people how to write bug reports. But, you know, bug reports got four critical components to it. It's got a title that briefly describes the problem. It's got a description, which is a much more in-depth uh, description of the problem that the title's often used as the search criteria in a bug database management system. It's got the steps to reproduce. You need to explain to somebody exactly how to set up and cause a bug. It's got expected versus actual results, what should happen and what is happening. Um, you know, 
I, I worked recently on Arkham City, and <sighs> that is my favorite game. I mean, I, I'm not, and I'm not saying that lightly. People that listen to this podcast know that's like top five games for me of all time. I absolutely love Arkham City. Well, that's one of the pleasures is when you, as a tester, when you get to work on a, a game that you enjoy. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a fun one to be on. But you know, that's a game. I don't know the exact number, but you know, you're talking forty thousand, fifty thousand issues in the bug database by the time the game ships. I mean, that's and that is the job harder today than it was then. Because if you're bug testing Donkey Kong Country, there's only so many things you can do. I'm sure there's a lot, a lot more than I think there would be. But, you know, there's a finite number of levels that Donkey Kong can move from left to right on. Arkham City uh, is an open world game where Batman can go anywhere and do anything. Is bug testing gotten more complex as games have gotten more complex? It has, but the, the tools and the methodology for doing it has gotten much better. Um, I can't go into too many details. Every game I've worked on, I've been under an NDA, so I don't. There's not too much I want to describe, sure, particularly sure. about Arkham. But you know, for example, if you were going to take an open world game, the first thing you would do is divvy it up into sections, map sections. You would build in a software reporting tool for things like X, Y, Z coordinates, so you can tell a level designer specifically where a problem is. Um, you'll build in, you know, essentially what were the cheats from the old days, the invincibility or the kill all enemies. Those are tools that you give the tester so that you don't have to fight your way through a level to get to a particular problem to find it. Um, And, you know, a lot of the the software tools that we use are a lot better. You know, when I was testing on uh, the Nintendo, we just had a VCR that was running constantly, and we'd put together a greatest hits, you know, reel of of bugs and turn that in at the end of the day. But these days you can go in with fraps and take a video capture of, you know, exactly what you're running into. You can use a screen print and then mark it up with uh, MS paint to highlight problems and write text on it. So the reporting tools have gotten much, much better. And, you know, things like the bug tracking systems we use today are very different than what we had, you know, back in the, the NES super Nintendo days. Even though you're a game tester and your job is playing these games to death, and we're talking about you know eating your favorite meal every day, do you go home and do you play video games for fun? You must. Used, it sounds like you love them. I, st- I still do, although I have a one-year-old now, so I don't have a lot of time for them. Um, but, so the types of games I play has, have changed. I, I love games like large story-based games like Mass Effect but, or you know Skyrim, but those are much tougher for me to find time to play these days. So I, I spend a lot of time on much more casual stuff. Uh, I love Steam. You know, I'm, I've got more games on my Steam account from Christmas sales than I have time to play. But Yeah, yeah, I'm like that too. What is, all these years later, your favorite NES game? Adventure of Link. Adventure of Link, wow! That's kind of the black sheep of the Zelda family, right? I know, I know that it's not the answer that people expect to hear, but... It was one that I had played and mastered before I even got in the door at Nintendo. And I just have fond memories of sitting in my living room, beating the crap out of that game. Um, And it was kind of my gateway introduction to the NES. That and Metroid and Strider were the three games that I really, really played a lot of before I went to work there. Can I ask you, and I don't mean to put you on the spot, but Adventure Link, I think most people agree, is by far, I'm even going to say by far, the worst of the Zelda games. And it's only because the Zelda games are so good. But can you defend Adventure of Link for those uh, that don't like it or maybe have never played it? Well, I think the reason for that disconnect is it's such a different type of game. Uh, You know, you look at The Legend of Zelda and it's radically different. Um... You know, my love for that game comes from my personal exposure to it. So I'm not sure I would try and convert anyone to my way of thinking. That's kind of like music, though. Like, uh, there's certain albums I like, and I couldn't rationally defend them as the best albums of all time, but they meant something to me at a certain place and a certain time, and I think games can do that, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're, they, it's something, you know, the generations that have come before us have had trouble understanding is that they are an art form into themselves. You know, they are 
stories that you don't just read. They are stories that you experience and help shape and become part of. Yeah. Like, I recently played XCOM, and Mass Effect did this to me, too. Um, the new XCOM, fantastic, wonderful game. If you didn't have a baby, I'd tell you you should play it because it's just ti- very oh, time-consuming. I have. I love that game. Oh, the it's so good, stuff. right? Sorry, baby. The original XCOM sucked so much of my life away. Yeah. So the new XCOM, um, I was telling my friend that was playing it, you know, you have an international squad of alien fighting soldiers, and you can name them all. And I told my friend, you got to name them when you play the game. Because I'm done with that game. I beat that game like three or four months ago. I still remember like the name of like every soldier in my squad. Like We went to war together. I knew those people. Yeah. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Do you think, uh, and we kind of talked about this a little bit earlier, that something is lost now that we don't need... I mean, do you know when the Nintendo... Obviously, we don't need the Nintendo hotline anymore. It's clearly obsolete. We don't even have to explain that. Do you know at what point that officially happened, though, when they realized that? Uh, I don't know. It was a gradual process. I certainly felt that uh, when the 900 number came into into effect. I was there for that change, and it it was kind of like, a, here's the writing on the wall kind of thing. When was that? Was that like during Super Nintendo? Yeah, it was sometime during the Super Nintendo era. So it's after the whole 8-bit generation already. Yeah, I left shortly after the Virtual Boy had been released, mm-hmm. and before the Nintendo 64 came out. Did you have to play Virtual Boy and like learn those games too? Oh, geez. I worked in, in a project testing Wario World. Oh man! Uh, Isn't that doesn't it like if you play Virtual Boy for too long, don't your eyes explode? Yeah, you're not supposed to play it for eight hours a day, but I did. Oh my god! Really? Did you have? Did you feel physical effects from that? I don't remember that one bothering me. I do remember Perfect Dark being a problem. That that was one where, as we were shipping it, they had a 24 hour bug bash to you know make sure they had shaken out all the the critical errors. We ended up canceling it, I think, 14 or 15 hours into it because we found a critical showstopper. But I remember driving home that night and thinking, man, the frame rate on this road is really not that good. Oh, yeah. Well, that's a real thing. When you play a video game too much, uh, you start to see it in the world. I'm actually just playing Triple Town on my iPhone now. It's a puzzle game. Pretty good iPhone puzzle game, and, and I'm definitely seeing like patterns when I see three things next to each other. Oh, yeah. Pe- people dream in Tetris all yeah, the time. Yeah, Tetris is, um, I think, the most well-known one for that. Uh, do you think... So, now that we... All right, so we have established that we don't have the Nintendo hotline anymore. Now that uh, it doesn't exist, now that codes aren't like a secret you have to trade in anymore, and it's just as easy as looking it up on your phone, do you think something is lost um, I don't know that it's lost, but it's it's different. It's like talking to somebody that grew up in the early era of television who saw the networks come into into being. Somebody who has cable today with 500 channels and on demand has trouble understanding what it was like when you had to wait for that day of the week for you and that certain time slot for your show to come on. Yeah. So it's I don't know that it's lost, but it's different. It's definitely different. And I think it's better than the TV example, though, because I think TV is, like, strictly... I think it's... I mean, maybe I'm just uh, not being nostalgic about it, but I think it's, like, strictly superior now because you can just watch whatever you want whenever you want. But games are different. Like, uh, these things are, you know... The experience of playing games is fundamentally different than it was 20 years ago. Well, it's fundamentally different, but it is as powerful today as it was then. I mean, our modern culture is driven by games and the characters in it. You look at people like cosplayers who show up at comic cons. I mean, those are driven by the games or by the media. Um, so it's, it, it's really an extension of our culture now. Uh, it's sort of the, the common currency, you know, you, you don't talk so much about TV as you used to, but you talk about the games that you've been playing and what's exciting. Um, you know, the sort of water cooler, conversations at work well i've always loved talking about games i anticipate that i will continue to love talking about games eric 
I thank you for your service, not only helping Nintendo customers who are lost find their way, but also fine-tuning games like Donkey Kong Country and Arkham City into the sharp, deadly instruments that they became. Uh, real quick, we're running out of time. Before we go, uh, what are some other games you work Well, on? I've worked for Microsoft. I've worked for Nintendo, of course. Um, I've worked for a number of small development companies. I made video games for the uh, United States government. I made worked on America's Army. Oh, wow. Was that different than working for a private company? Uh, that could be a whole other show. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the Army kind of gives people a job and expects them to get it done, uh, whether they have enough resources or not. Yeah, that sounds like what the Army should be doing. That's kind of how they managed us. Get this done. I want more. <laughs> another time, perhaps. This was a lot of fun, and I would love an opportunity to do this another time. Thank you so much for talking to us today, Aaron. Thanks. I've, I've had a good time going down memory lane. That is it for this week's Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. But don't forget that in addition to this podcast, I do a web video series called Bleep Bloop on College Humor, and that new episodes come out every other week, and this is one of those weeks. So on Wednesday... If you go to collegehumor.com slash bleepbloop, you will see a new episode featuring myself and my co-host Ben Castles and one of our all-time favorite Bleep Bloop guests, Dan Klein. And we are playing the Eminem trilogy of games on the Wii. Everyone I tell that to says the rapper or the candy. The candy. And yes, I said trilogy. There are three Eminem video games on the Wii. They are some of the strangest games I have ever seen. Just like things about them are off. Like, there's one where the plot, this one has a plot. Um, the M&Ms are at the candy factory. They're about to go on break for Christmas. And one of them says to the others, I hope I get a lawn hoop for Christmas. A lawn hoop, you know, a hoop for your lawn. You might want a hoop for your lawn for Christmas. The people that were writing this game just had to name any now. Just name a thing. Look around the room, pick a thing. No wrong answers except for lawn hoop. That's what we're dealing with, and there's three of them. So that's Bleep Loop this week. Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show, for the next two weeks for the rest of March, we've got some, and I hope it doesn't sound like I'm bragging, in fucking credible guests lined up. Next week on the show, we are going to be talking to Moira Quirk, who you may know as Mo from Guts. That's right, Mo from Guts, for an hour, next week on the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. But right now... I'm going to do something a little different. I'm going to read a letter I got. Uh, this letter came from Tumblr from a user called Tacit Collusion. And he writes, My question is this. Have you ever considered doing a listener mailbag type segment at the beginning slash whenever you want of each episode? Comic Book Club, which side note, now this is Jeff talking. This is no longer Tacit Collusion. Comic Book Club, terrific podcast, and I was on it a few weeks ago, so go check that out. Anyway, now we're going back to the letter. So this is, and again, just to be clear, none of this was what Tacit Collusion wrote. He didn't write, this is Jeff talking. This is actually Jeff talking. And now, now, as soon as I say now, the next time after that time, I'm going to be back in the letter. Okay, ready? Now. Comic Book Club has their questions from the audience time, and that's always one of the best parts of the show. I realize the unofficial model of your show is, quote, interviews you didn't want to hear, but there are some things your fans and listeners do want to hear, especially from you. Think about it, maybe? All right, this is Jeff again, and I've thought about it. Let's give it a shot. Uh, let's try doing a mailbag next week. I can't promise that there's going to be questions worth answering. This may be the last time we ever speak of a mailbag segment, but I'm open to giving it a shot. Let's see what you guys have. So send me questions, and you can send them to my Twitter, where I'm at Jeff Rubin Show, to my Tumblr, where I'm Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin .com. Uh, You know I read them, because I just read Tastic Illusions. Uh, there is Facebook fan page, and my email, Jeff Rubin at JeffRubinShow.com, and that's it. Oh, I think I owe you guys a preview of the Mo episode. Here is a quick clip of what you're going to be hearing next week when we talk to Mo, the referee from Nickelodeon's game show, Guts. Were there any events that you, you particularly liked? Like, you had a favorite event to referee and to watch and to be a spectator of? Or did you like the elastic sports or the pool sports? Um, there was one particular one that I did like. I liked anything that m was comical to me. Um, <laughs> that was one where they had to um, like grab a football. There's a lot of American footballs coming down, and they were um, attached to elastic, and it would pull them back. And if they 
stretch too far forward. It would just yank them back. Uh, and to me, I loved that game. I don't know what it was called. Um, yeah, but I loved that one. And there was another one, and this one made me laugh because we'd had a, um, a meeting afterwards. I don't think Albie had been quite happy with um, how the sets or whatever, how things had been moved. And so he was talking with his art director, Byron, and uh, and Byron just got a little irritated. He said, well, because Albie said, well, what's going on? Why isn't it moving? And and Albie was, and Byron was just like, well, we've got to set this up and put this over here and we've got to scatter some leaves. And uh, and I think I lost it right then that there would be something so important in a sporting arena about scattering some leaves. That's all you get for now, but hopefully it has wet your whistle, wet your whistle, and you will be back next week to hear from Mo, and also to hear the announcement of the guest the following week, who may be, all due respect to Mo and Eric today, may be the biggest, most exciting guest we have ever had on the Jeff Rubin, Jeff Rubin Show. That's going to be the last week in March, and I'll tell you about that in this space next week. But for now, bye! Bye!